Namaskar. In this lecture and the one that follows, we will be looking at another important aspect of cognition which helps human factor psychologists or human factor engineers. In the last class, we covered information processing, memory and attention and I explained it to you how memory and attention help in multitasking. Multitasking is an important aspect when studying individuals who are interacting with systems as multitasking helps individuals in performing one or more job at the same time. In this section, we will look at decision making. At times, people may have facts and other information available about a particular event. There might also be multiple events and all those events could be possible solutions to a problem. So, how do operators decide which particular option to choose over the other? This is the core of this lecture. What all information should an operator consider? How he should reason evidences for and against each option and then choose a optimal alternative for a solution to a problem. Also, what does it mean to have an optimal solution to a problem? We will also look at multiple ways of making decisions and we will further explore the real life decision making. Further to it, we will look at several shortcuts that people use in making decisions and towards the end, I will focus on those problems which exist in making decisions. So, to start thing up, let me give you a scenario. So, assume there is a truck driver and he has to transport goods from place A to place B. While he is moving from point A to point B, he has to navigate roads and these roads could be of various types. You may have flat land, you may have hills and you may have other natural obstacles which may be present in the road and which may sometimes helps and sometimes deter the performance of this driver in terms of driving. So, now this driver is carrying goods from point A to B and he has reached a midway section which is point C. From point C to point D, the driver has to climb a valley and it is already night time. Now, he could decide to climb a valley during night time, but as you are aware that mountain roads have their own problem and it is to be best avoided during the night time. There could be safety concerns or there could be environmental factors like landslide or some other environmental hindrances which may prevent the driver from driving too fast and also during the whole drive he has to be more cautious. Mountain driving in itself is a tough job. There is a twist to the situation. The goods that he is carrying belong to a party and this party is constantly calling this driver and asking him to deliver the goods 
quickly. The driver is also thinking that if I can cross this valley during the night, I will be able to complete the task on time and also have some hours of break before I go into the next trip. But then there is a countering thought which says that night driving is not safe. There may be problems like he could have a vehicle breakdown or some natural disaster may happen because of which he may not be able to complete the drive and the worst situation would be he would get into an accident. The driver weighs all goods and bads about driving in the night and then decides to drive. My question to you would be was this decision of driving in the night to reach the destination where he wants to reach a good decision. On one end, if he drives during the night, he will reach the goal faster and get some rest in between drives. On the other hand, driving in this mountain road is risky and could lead to fatal accidents. So, what should have the driver done? Is his decision of driving during the night a good one or a bad one? And this question that I have is the core of this lecture and the one that follows. How do people decide? Decision making helps operators and manufacturers and developers in getting the best solution to problems. But what is the best solution? Once you will start learning this chapter, you will come to know what is decision making and why should we do it? What are the models of decision making? What are the problems that happen in decision making? And what kind of solutions to be provided so that people become better decision makers. So, let us start looking at some of these points. So, what is decision making then? In real life situation, we are often faced with facts, information which we need to make decisions as in by doing what? you will get what kind of response and by avoiding what you can get what kind of response. In addition to this, we also get other information and these influence the decision making process. Looking back at the example that I gave you, facts are related to the knowledge that the driver has in terms of not driving during the night and how if he drives during the night, he would achieve the goal and have some movements of rest between. Other information concerns the pressure that he is getting from the people whose good he is carrying, 
other people's expectation from him that when he reaches the goal, he will visit them and they will have a good family time and some other information not directly concerned to the decision. So, while the driver makes a decision, he has to concern himself with the facts which is present in him and other information which are not directly concerned with the facts, but which play a major role in him driving. Decision making mainly involves rules of thumb and systematic tendencies called heuristics and biases to reduce cognitive demand and decision making. What it says is that when we make decisions, we do not work as computers, we do not calculate the mathematical probabilities and utilities of various options available. Rather what we do is we use shortcuts and we use certain rules of thumb and using these shortcuts and rules of thumb help us in making decisions more efficiently much faster and does not put too much load on our cognitive capacity. If we weigh all the possibilities and calculate in a mathematical way the optimal decision, it would be very difficult to arrive at the optimal decision for certain problems. We look at why this is a problem. So, what people do is they use those tricks which has worked in the past and make decisions. Decision making is also influenced by the gain of experience. Experts are better decision makers because they have a lot of experience. As you do a job, more number of times you learn the in and out of a job and you gain experience. This experience tells you what to do and what not to do and through this experience you can then further take decisions. These decisions will help your future performance as well as you coping to new unfamiliar situations. So, decision making is defined as a task which requires an individual to choose among several alternatives with some uncertainty regarding which choice is the best. In decision making, you have to choose between alternatives. The alternatives that you get in decision making comes from the process of judgment. People use reasoning and judgment to come up with alternatives and these alternatives then have to be used for achieving a goal. The job of decision making is to choose one of the alternatives given by judgment. Now, the alternatives which are available are not always certain. They do not have 100 percent probability of happening or not happening. There is always a chance and an uncertainty with an alternative working. The job of the decision maker is to consider these alternatives and the uncertainty is related with these alternatives and make decisions because when he is doing this, he is taking certain amounts of risks. So, dependent on his risk tolerance, operators make decisions. Human factor experts understand how individuals make decisions, what information they use and what tasks require decisions are performed poorly. The job of human factor specialists 
is to study the decision making process of individuals when they are interacting with systems. They also need to understand what are those information which operators had considered in making a decision and what are those information which they did not include in making a decision. And they also need to understand which jobs were poorly performed. If they understand which decision job was poorly performed and the reason for poor performance, they can design better solutions and automated decision processes which may assist the operator in accomplishing a job. The human factor specialist use this knowledge to decide what and which information should be displayed to achieve better decisions within the operator. Once human factor specialists come to know how decisions were made, what information was considered and what jobs decision was fruitful, they will work out design interfaces and design solutions which will give only those information to operators which are absolutely necessary for making a decision. If there are processes which need huge computation, this they will divulge to the automated system and a simplified version of these complex calculations will be presented to the operator in terms of yes and no decision. So, knowledge from what people actually do while doing a job helps human factor experts in designing systems which help human in making better decisions. Once you have this information as in what the user is actually doing and where is he failing, human factor experts can use this information to allocate some of the difficult decisions which do not require human input to automated systems and other decisions which require a input to the human operator. Look at the example of flying a plane. There are certain decisions which require a lot of cognitive capacity or there are certain routine decisions which are not very essential in flying. Those are taken care of by the autopilot. But certain other decisions as to whether you should land at an airport which is different from the airport which has been assigned to you or changing with the angle of approach, these decisions are left to the pilots. Landing and takeoffs mostly are done by autopilots because they require complex calculations and computers can do these complex calculations very easily. What computers would do is give them a simplified version of the decision in a yes no paradigm. The pilot has to feed his answer and the computer can perform this job. This way pilots get time to rest as well as make optimal decisions by using their cognitive capacity in only those parts of the decision which are really difficult or which are really important in any decision making scenario. Now, there are two models of decision making that we will discuss. One is called the normative model and the other is called the descriptive model. 
In addition to these two classic models, there is a third model which is called naturalistic decision making proposed by Klein and others. We will also look at that kind of decision making model. Now, let us briefly understand the three models. The normative model of decision making says what are the norms of decision making, meaning which what should an ideal operator do in certain situations. If there is a situation and it needs to be solved, normative decision model proposes how an ideal operator should work to get rational choices. A rational choice is a choice which has maximum profit and minimum losses. In comparison, the descriptive model talks about how operators actually take decisions. There is an idealized form of making decision which is called the normative form and proposed by the normative model, but in actuality the operator does things differently than the ideal situation and this is called the descriptive model. The naturalistic decision model studies individual performances in real life world. How real life decision making is different from the theoretical normative and descriptive model is the basis of the naturalistic decision model system. So, let us start understanding one by one what these models are. We will start with the first model which is called the normative model. The normative model is based on the model of utility described in economics. So, it is a mathematical model and it calculates optimal decisions in terms of expected utility. I will explain this in much easier term as we move forward in the lecture. So, some definitions. What is the normative model? It is a deliberate or rational process of decision making in which individuals rationally weigh the available information to determine optimal decisions. The normative model believes that humans are rational and the decision making process is also rational. Human wings are compared to machines which weigh all possible options and information related to all options then calculate the gain or loss from each course of action and based on the net value achieved for each option, it decides the most beneficial path to be taken while a system gets into a problem. The model do not involve time and memory constraints and are characteristics of scientists and physicians. The normative model believes that humans have indefinite memory and they have all the time in the world necessary to make decisions. When you start weighing all information which may be available for making the decision to choose an option, this requires a lot of cognitive capacity. You have to think about 
every possible scenario that may exist and how it would turn up to be. Human beings neither have indefinite memory nor indefinite time. But idealized systems have the capacity to weigh all options and all possible available information and come up with solutions. The normative form of decision making is a trademark of scientists and physician. Both scientists and physicians have to be highly accurate in their predictions because somebody's life depends on it. Not that they do not use heuristics, but their dependence of heuristics or shortcuts are limited. So, they try and follow the normative model up to the best possible limit which they can. Now, normative models have four different components integrated in it. The first component is the identification of a choice alternative. There can be a number of solutions, some covert and some overt for a particular problem. The first step in normative decision making is to identify which alternative are available. Once you have the alternatives in hand, you have to think about all those situations which may happen and may not happen and which may favor your decision to go with that alternative. Each alternative is related to an event which either supports or opposes it. Normative decision making requires you to consider all these events whether it is beneficial or it is non-beneficial. The third step in normative decision making is to come up with a potential outcome. After choosing an alternative and after considering all events that may or may not happen, what is the possible outcome that can be reached? And once all these are done, the last step is to assess the probability of each outcome. Again going back to the example of the driver that we referred to previously, the first step if he is using the normative model is to identify the choice alternative. There are two alternatives either to drive during the night or to stay back and drive during the morning. A number of events may or may not happen. If you drive during the night, there could be accidents or there could be other problems and so these may support not driving. But other events like if you drive during the night, you may get a clear road and because of that you would reach your goal faster and get some amount of rest which is an added benefit. Potential outcome, if you drive during the night, the accidents that happen could be one outcome. As I just defined, while driving during the night you could see a landfall or some part of your car or truck that you are using may break down and this could lead to accidents. Another possibility is that if you drive during the night, you may get a clear road and because of that you may reach your goal earlier. So, these are the two potential outcomes and then you have to look at the assessment of probability of each outcome. By using experiences, the driver can easily predict whether driving during the night is beneficial or not because he gets data from other drivers, how many accidents have happened, how many times 
there is a problem and how many drivers have completed the task of driving quickly during the night. So, considering all these alternatives, he will make a final choice. One problem that may exist in the normative model is determining the probability and values associated with each outcome. All of these outcomes are hypothetical since the driver is still thinking on what to do. If you drive during the night, you would reach the goal faster, but you may not get a time to rest. So, the value of this, the satisfaction that you get by delivering the goods faster and the extra time that you get, this is called the value of this alternative. And what is the probability that you will be able to reach faster? You may get into a traffic jam. So, you have to calculate this. On the other hand, not driving would lose time, but you would be safe. So, the utility is saving your life and the probability is how likely do you want to this event to happen. By calculating these, you can decide whether you want to drive or you do not want to drive during the night, but it is not easy. All these calculations of what do I get out of it and what is the chance of this happening is a difficult job because it is all hypothetical and a mental simulation through which you are creating these probabilities and values. You also use information from memory. But as I will talk ahead in this lecture, these information may be biased and so may not give you a complete picture of whether you should use this information or not. So, problems may arise in determining the probabilities and values. Another important aspect is the desirability or undesirability associated with the potential outcome. Two outcomes that our driver faces. One saving life or being safe and the other being unsafe, but reaching somewhere fast. So, if you be safe, you will lose reaching the goal faster, but if you be a little unsafe, then you will reach a goal faster. How desirable or undesirable both these options are? will also help drivers decide whether he wants to drive during the night or not. If he has some work near the place where he has to deliver his good or he has some appointment with someone, he may decide to drive. But if he is not in a hurry, he may decide to choose staying back and then drive during the morning. So, this desirability and desirability has an important fact and role to play in normative decision making. The utility may be an objective gain, a physical gain or gain in something more subjective. I talked about the value of the decision. The value of the decision is related to something called utility. Utility means what good a decision is going to get you. Utility is related to an objective gain. If the driver drives during the night and reaches early, he may get more money. Physical gain, he may get more rest or some other gain, he may get the pleasure to meet his family. On the other hand, if he does not drive, the objective gain would be not too much, but physical gain would be he will get enough rest and he will be able to drive much better and something else is the idea that he will be safe. So, utility of a decision or value of an alternative is dependent on these gains that people try to extract. The utility of an outcome corresponds to the monetary value of potential gains. It is very difficult to test the expected utility theory 
in terms of those decisions which have a subjective value because assigning value to utilities becomes difficult. You cannot give numbers to satisfaction that people get or the driver would get in reaching early. So, it becomes really difficult to calculate a value. For this particular purpose, gambling tasks are used to study expected utility. One simple reason of using gambling task is the utility of a particular decision can be measured in terms of what gains or losses you are having from taking a particular decision. So, in a casino, if you are playing a game and if you win the game, the amount of money that you get or the amount of money that you lose will be equivalent to the monetary gain. So, values can be correspondingly studied and easily measured. The probability of an outcome which is win or lose and the utility which is the monetary value are considered before deciding to gamble. As I described a moment ago that studying normative expect studying expected value or normative model in real life situations or in terms of humans become difficult because people attach values in more subjective ways. Sometimes people will prefer rest over monetary benefit or satisfaction over monetary benefit. So, how do I value satisfaction then? Monetary benefits could be termed in terms of gains and losses, but how is satisfaction a gain or a loss? And sometimes people use covert subjective parameters for measuring value. Then you won't even have the reason why people are making certain decisions. For that very reason, we need to use gambling tasks. Now, when you want to know how decision should be made or what is an expected value of a particular option in a gambling task, the first thing that you have to do is calculate the probability of an outcome in terms of winning and losing and then calculate the utility as in how much winning is desirable and how much losing is desirable. If you calculate the probability of an event happening and the utility of that event, you will have some idea as to whether you should go ahead and take this decision. These values can be calculated to come up with the expected value of an outcome. So, expected value of an outcome is the sum of probabilities of all outcomes into the value of all outcome. In terms of an equation, the expected value is the value of the win into the probability of win and the value of losses into the probability of losses. Let us take a quick example to understand. Let us say you went to a casino and there is a game that you want to play. The game is of a roll of a dice. Now, if you roll the dice and you get 6, you will get 100 rupees. There is a catch. The entry ticket to this game is 10 rupees. Should you play this game or not? Let us calculate. So, expected value of playing this gamble 
is the value of winning. So, 100 rupees you win, but 10 rupees is the entry fees. So, the expected value of win is 90 rupees and the probability of winning is you have to get 6. So, there is only one possibility of getting a 6 in a roll of a dice. Of losing, if you do not win, you will lose 10 rupees and the expected value of this is 5 upon 6. And so, the expected value is 90 into 1 by 6 minus 10 into 5 by 6 and this can be easily calculated which will give me 15 minus 1 point so well, let us assume that it is 2 this is an assumption approximation so it will be 10 and approximately uh, because I am not calculate so it is approximate value a value of 5 rupees. These kind of calculations help you in deciding whether to play or not. So, there are 90 rupees that you are going to win and the chance of this is 1 upon 6, but there is a chance of losing 10 rupees and that is 5 out of 6 times. You can calculate this yourself and come up with an answer as to what will be the expected value and that if it is positive, you may play this gamble, if it is negative, you may decide not to play. Now, the utility theory is a poor indicator of decision making behavior in humans. One simple reason for this is that utility theory uses cal complex calculations and humans do not have that much time to do these calculations. So, a newer form of expected utility theory has been proposed which is called the subjective expected value. Now, in response to the discrepancy between predictors based on the expected value and actual human behavior, theories propose the subjective expected value. Subjective expected value is the value that operators can assigned to certain options, but it is subjective. Monetary values are visible and it is same for everyone. Subjective expected values would be different for different people as in what comfort do you get from using this option. Some people having a night sleep is comfort and for other people having five course dinner and then night sleep and something else would be comfort both of them will rate 5 for comfort, but one requires only sleep and the other requires so many other things. And this way, if we use a scale to measure the comfort from both the people, we will get the same value. So, this is an idea behind the subjective expected value. This approaches acknowledges that the value individuals assigned to potential outcomes are not strictly dependent on monetary gains and losses, but are influenced by particular goals of an individual. As I just discussed, this particular subjective expected value suggests that the way people decide is not purely dependent on gains and losses, but are dependent on subjective parameters or subjective calculations. The next form of decision making is called the descriptive. It is what humans actually do rather than what they should have done. Now, humans while making decisions do not engage in slow and elaborate deliberation process on account of limited working memory and cognitive capacity according with situational factors. Humans are bound by something called bounded rationality. They have limited information about alternatives. Sometimes situations does not allow you to gather more information and do mental calculation. 
and humans also have limited working memory and cognitive capacity to calculate all possible outcomes and probabilities of certain events happening. Because of that, they cannot be equivalent to human computers in calculating the expected value of each outcome. So, what they do is they use shortcuts in making decisions and these shortcuts are called heuristics. So, rather than employing one strategy or heuristic, human's decision maker is quite flexible in selecting appropriate strategy from memory. What humans do is they find the similarity between the alternative which is present in front of them and a decision that they have taken in the past which has helped them in achieving a goal. They do this mapping and based on that they select the decision by using the correct alternative. Now, experienced decision maker employ a various kinds of heuristics which can be extremely effective in some situations but results in bias and, bias and poor decisions in others. When you use shortcuts, it is all about mapping. If you make a decision in some situation and it worked for you, it may not work in other situations. So, heuristics may help you in accomplishing a job, but at some other situation it may not work. So, some shops would take money online and you can carry your phone and pay them, but smaller vendors vegetable sellers will not take online money because they may not have an account and so carrying a phone to help you in making purchases may work with bigger shops which offer you this facility, but using the same argument and trying to buy things from vegetable vendors may not work. This is what is the meaning of this sentence which I just described. So, solutions may work, but at other times it may create biases or poor decisions. Heuristics are mental shortcuts or rules of thumb that allow an individual to make a quick decision or choose with little effort by trading accuracy and effort. Heuristics or rules of thumb as in what should be done in terms of how this particular solution has worked in future may suffer from the several shortcomings. But one thing heuristics does is it gives you the chance to make quick decisions, faster decisions and with little effort because what heuristics do is they trade off accuracy for effort. So, some solutions may work and some solutions may not work. Think about doctors, they give you a medicine and if it does not work they change the medicine. What they are doing is something called hit and trial. By looking at what symptoms you are displaying, they find the best medicine, but if it does not work, they change the medicine. This is something which descriptive model suggests. What you do is instead of being accurate, you become quick. So, those doctors which give you quicker medicines are considered best doctors. But what they are actually doing is they are using heuristics because the same medicine has worked in similar kind of situations in a different patient, they believe that it will work on other patients also. And so, this way of making decisions is called the descriptive model. Now, the decision making operator, they select normative processes that evaluates all necessary information and potential trade off between one or more value attribute if 2 to 3 alternatives are involved. It has been proposed that if there are only 2 or 3 alternatives for a particular decision, most decision makers will use a normative approach. They will try and evaluate all possible outcomes and all possible events that may happen with an outcome for each alternative and then calculate a decision. But as the alternatives go on increasing from 6 to 12, decision makers 
try to use some form of non compensatory strategy in making decision. Now, when we, we have two to three options, people generally use a compensatory strategy. What they do is they trade off among attributes represents compensatory decision making where positive attributes can compensate for, ne uh, for negatives. So, if two to three alternatives are available, people compensate in terms of taking that option or replacing that feature which is not available in option and taking another feature which may be important. So, you are going to buy a phone and you want 5 or 6 features, but one of 2 features are not available in the phone of your choice. There is another phone which has those 1 or 2 features, but it may not ha have 4 or 5 features that you are looking for. If there are only 2 or 3 alternatives, what you will do is you will use a compensatory mechanism as in you will propose that I will not take 1 or 2 features which may not be that important, but I will go with the option which has all the features. But when there are 7 or 8 alternatives, some offering something and some offering something else, how do you make decisions? In those cases, people use something called non-compensatory decision making strategies. And what are non-compensatory? There are couple of non-compensatory decision making strategies. One is called the elimination by aspect. This approach assumes that individuals evaluate the attributes of different alternatives and eliminate from further consideration those alternatives that are not just to be attractive. If there are a number of alternatives, people look at those alternatives which are attractive, which offer them more value. Those alternatives which do not offer them more value or which do not satisfy the primary need of buying a particular product or taking a particular decision, they will simply eliminate and remove them these alternatives from consideration. This is called elimination by aspect. I will use a particular aspect. So, I use a mobile phone mainly for viewing videos. I will use that phone which has the capacity to display good videos and so all other phones which do not have this capacity I will eliminate and this is called eliminating by aspect. Now, instead of eliminating those options that do not meet our minimum requirements, we might settle for good enough rather than the perfect choice. Another way of doing this non-compensatory form of decision making is by selecting an object which is good enough, which has most of the properties. So, instead of saying that the one reason which makes me buy a phone is the video thing, what I could do is I could look at which phone is offering me the best possible value with the money that I have. And I will say that this phone is although not good, but it is offering more number of features that I want. This form of choosing decisions is called satisficing. Why do people use these kind of uh, techniques? One reason could be time constraints or limited capacity to identify and evaluative alternatives can restrict our ability to identify the best choice. So, because of time constraints or limited capacity or limited knowledge, we do not have that much cognitive capacity left to do the evaluation. So, what we do is we choose the most beneficial option which is available. In those circumstances, we may be more likely to select an acceptable alternative and this strategy is called satisficing, which is an amalgam of the word satisfying and sufficing. Satisfying because it satisfies most of your need and sufficing meaning that it is sufficient for you to handle whatever work you want to do with your cell phone. So, in this class we looked at what is decision making and two different models of decision making. In the next class we will look at some heuristics people use in making decision making 
and another form of decision making which is called the naturalistic decision making. You will also look at some of the errors that happen while making decisions. This is all for this class. Thank you and Namaskar.